To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, and have been become wealthy, and you have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich, the white garments so that you may clothe yourselves, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to your to appoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm. Well, we just bow in a moment of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for thy word which has brought light to our hearts and given us new birth by the imperishable word of God. We pray that, uh, Lord, thy word will illumine our hearts and guide us into all truth. We ask in the precious name and for the glory of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so these seven messages, uh, which we read about in, chap in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, are messages our messages uh, to local churches <clears throat> and uh, as you may know they are a history a moral history of the church from the time of Pentecost up to when the Lord Jesus returns in other words between the two advents of Christ between the two appearances of Christ and uh, now we need to, uh, well, we can just read in Revelation chapter 1. And uh, verse 11, please. Saying, write in a book that he, what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Eph Ephesus and to Simona and to Pergamum, and to Tyutera, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Yeah. So, we need to uh, notice uh, some significant things about these seven churches. First of all, uh, if denominations, uh, missions, were in God's plan, there would have been no need to give a separate message to each church. You see? Why Why bother with that? Because it, you could have just given one message to, the, to all seven churches. Uh, and these are what these denominations do today. You know, they're centralized. Uh, but also these are local churches. And you notice that not one of these churches were called Mother Church. Not one of these churches were any higher than the other church. In God's sight, they were all equal. And uh, Lord Jesus Christ had a message for each of these churches. And there are two uh, important things which have damaged and destroyed uh, God's order in the local church in the past 2,000 years. Number one is uh, the, uh, the having of uh, one man, like a pastor, instead of 
in other words, being governed by one man instead of by elders. And, you know, in the first century, uh, local churches were governed by elders. In the second century, a man called Ignatius came along and he introduced this, uh, this system of having one man as, the, uh, as kind of the leader in the church. And, um, you see, uh, in the Greek, uh, the word that's normally used for elder is presbyterios, which, which has the idea of shepherding the flock. If you turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, chapter uh, 5 and uh, uh, we'll read uh, verse 1 to 3 Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed shepherd the flock of God among you exercise over oversight not under compulsion but voluntarily according to the will of god and not for sordid gain but with eagerness nor yet as lodging it over these allotted to your charge but proving to be examples of your flock. yeah see the word used for elders there in all every case is presbyterus and that is the main word used for shepherds in the greek and in the new testament there is another word used which is episkopos and that uh, means like leader in the church. So both words, you know, when put together, you know, the elder is one who gives organization leadership, but he's also one with the heart of a shepherd who looks after the flock. So, and the second uh, thing that damaged uh, uh, the early church and the church throughout the ages is centralization and I'll tell you how it happened you know um, the you know in the beginning as I said there were elders the local assembly was governed by elders then about the second century one of these elders was called became prominent and he was called uh, a presbyter or in the english the english king james translations uh, that it calls it a bishop so uh, then one man became prominent in a local church they called him a bishop and then uh, these local assemblies were grouped into groups, like, for example, the churches or the assemblies of, let's say, Palestine or Syria or Asia Minor or Italy or whatever. All the areas around the Mediterranean where the church uh, became established. And then... So what happened was one big bishop would be in charge of all these lesser bishops who were bishops of the local church. Then finally these big bishops over these local churches came under one big, even bigger bishop, if you like, in Rome, who eventually turned out to be the Pope. And that's how Satan successfully destroyed church order. In those two ways, he destroyed church order uh, in, uh, in the church, in the local assemblies. And it's strange, but Christians have, down through the ages, have not learnt from these things. Because every 
every great revival of God, uh, they come back to the truth of the Bible to a lesser or greater extent. And then they start centralization. Satan loves centralization because if he can poison the center, then all those local churches which are governed by the center get the same poison or, if you like, spiritual uh, wrong things. So that's why Satan wants centralization. But in every revival uh, in the past 2,000 years, it always happens, centralization. And, you know, they use many excuses. Oh, we... Uh, we uh, we want control over all these churches because it help it, we have to keep them in the correct teaching, you know. But actually, the biblical way is government of the local assembly from within, not from without. And Satan has many subtle ways of bringing about this centralization. For example, if elders from or let's say senior brothers from different from different assemblies, they meet together every month, for example, for prayer, and they make decisions which affect all the other churches which they're responsible for, then they're basically a denomination, you know, because all decisions affecting local assemblies should be taken in the local assembly itself, not in a collection of uh, elders or, or uh, leading brothers from different assemblies deciding a policy uh, for all the churches. So, you see, in this way, uh, Satan centralizes and brings control. Now, these are the things which um, which brings deadness to churches, like planning control uh, these are the uh, things which uh, saps away the life of uh, the local assemblies so and when you think about it you know this pastoral system where or you know where you have one man controlling uh, a local assembly uh, it has the tendency to make the people who he ministers to like an audience like in a cinema or something like something like that or a theater or something like that you know and it tends to make believers lazy because they say oh the the god servant or the pastor he makes all the decisions he has to be spiritual he's the spiritual one you know and uh we are just listeners you know so and there's very little uh there's very little, um, you know, um, like uh, participating uh, in the work of the local assembly. So this is very important, you know, if you can get get that, these principles that is into your head and stick to them, you know, that is very important. So... If we turn back to Revelation chapter 3... So, uh, Ephesians, the message to the Ephesians starts in the early church and up to about 90 AD, let's say. And even by then, you know, it says, God says you have left your first love. And uh, when you read about the later epistles, the later letters um, of uh, John, Peter, Jude, you can already see that they're warning people about false teachings coming into the church. So you can see, you can understand why about 90 AD that uh, already the love of the church was becoming cold. And, but when you read Laodicea, it, 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 the message to Laodicea, in the end, which is the message to the church in the end days, it's much more serious 
sickness. You know? God even talks about spitting them out of his mouth uh, because they are lukewarm, neither hot or cold. And even when you read in, uh, in, that, uh, in this church, um, to their shame, in verse 20, Lord Jesus is standing outside the church, knocking to come in. Can you imagine that? And uh, he's not even among them at all. And then, so Laodicea was in, uh, is one of those churches in what today is Western Turkey. And in that time, it was a very, it was a, a banking area, a banking town uh, for the whole area. Uh, or I don't know how you'd say it today. They, got, they held uh, the banking system for the whole area. And it was also, also in Laodicea, uh, there was a famous hospital, uh, eye hospital. <coughs> and uh, so obviously God knew because there, these things uh, which he says to Laodicea are in that uh, context. And... Uh, so, uh, and what does Laodicea mean? You know, here's another proof. You know, uh, Laos means uh, people, and Dicea means judgment. And so, in the end days, it's the people. The emphasis is on the people, not on God. And isn't that how you know the mood and uh, the thinking, the philosophy of people today? Uh, humanism, human rights, uh, the spirit of the Antichrist, the number six, 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 but as it says in Revelation 13, uh, the human number. So, uh, so it's, you know, you can well understand why Laodicea means the judgment of the people with the emphasis on the people. And, uh, the Lord Jesus introduces himself uh, at the start of every message to the church when he says he's the faithful and true witness in verse 14. Actually, in uh, the, uh, the word for witness in the original, in the Greek, is the same as the word for martyr. So, as far as the Greek world were concerned. A witness was a martyr. So that was the spirit uh, they had in the early church. If you want to be a witness, you took your life in your hands. And, uh, you know, that is uh, uh, how we should be, really, as witnesses. Because, you know, generally speaking, so long as... Be the church, so long as believers keep quiet, they don't suffer any trouble. But if they speak the truth, and then they often have to suffer persecution. And so we have to be prepared for that, you know, to speak the truth and not to be afraid. You know, we, we go a different way to the rest of the world. And uh, uh, we have people who go in opposite direction to the way of the world. And uh, that is a very hard way very often. And that is a way, you know, if which we're prepared to go on that way, then we have to suffer for Christ's sake. And so that is what a true Christian is, you know, one who's chosen to go the opposite way to which the world are going. You know, and... Uh, uh, for that, very often, we have to suffer, especially if our witness is bold. And the Lord says, I know that, verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. So that is a terrible thought to be spat out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
so, um, so we have to ask ourselves, is our love for the Lord lukewarm? Is it, do we fall into that category? So you are neither hot nor cold. You're just tepid. And uh, so that means we are in danger of being spat out of the mouth of the Lord if we are like that. And and verse 17, we see that this is a deceived church. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And uh, you see, a deceived church. They thought they were rich. But actually, they were in miserable spiritual poverty. So isn't that true of uh, God's people today? You know, as we were saying last time, we have everything. We've, you know, what generation before us was able to hold the Bible in our hands in our own language? And yet today there is a famine for the Word of God, according to Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Even though we have the Word of God, there is such confusion uh, in teaching today uh, that uh, people seek to the north, south, east and west and do not find it according to Amos chapter 8 and verse 11 so um, so God's remedy is uh, so you know in verse 17 it talks about miserable uh <coughs> Poor, blind, naked. So, poor in faith, spiritual blindness, and nakedness because we don't have spiritual clothes. And it says, you know, God, doesn't, God is not negative. He gives the answer. I advise you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. So, like one verse in... Uh, I think it's in uh, Ecclesiastes, which said the dross <coughs> has come on the gold, you know, and that's what Christians are like. You know what gold? If you want gold to look nice, you have to polish it. Uh, but if it doesn't, you know, often with age, it has a, a dross on it, and uh, it needs to be polished off. So God wants us to buy gold tried in the fire. And as we know, gold has to be purified seven times until, you know, with the goldsmith heating it up, cleaning off the, all, this, all the dirt which comes to the top, cleaning it off and then heating it up a second time, then a little bit less dirt on top, floating to the top and scooping it off and then heating it up seven times until finally, the final test, is when he can see his face in the surface of the gold. Then he knows that all the dross has been taken away. And that's how God deals, you know, how deals with us. You know, that's why we go through so many sufferings and trials, because God wants to remove that dross, that, uh, uh, we can say dirt, but it's not dross, it's a good word, uh, takes away all that which is not pleasing to God. Because God wants to make us into the likeness of his Son. And uh, he wants them to put in us his divine nature. And to make us like him. That we might come up to the level of his Son. So that we might be a worthy bride for his Son. And, and uh, of course, you know, in this verse in Revelation 19... If you could turn to Revelation 19. And reading verse 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and be glad, and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Yeah, there are two two things, two points to notice here. It says, 
end of verse 7, his wife hath made herself ready. That means it is our responsibility to make, to, f to be, become ready for the marriage, to make ourselves, uh, bring ourselves up to the standard where uh, we are ready uh, to be presented. You know, it says in Jude that one day which Christ is looking forward to with much joy is when he presults that when he presents us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, that will be the happiest day for the Lord Jesus when his completed church is, you know, you can imagine you know, when God, he dwells in unapproachable light. You know, who can approach to God, you know, even in our, uh, in our immortal, in our unimmortal state? Now we could never uh, approach to such, uh, uh, you know, even when Moses had the veil over his face, uh, the children of Israel, uh, sorry, even without the veil on Moses' face, the children of Israel dead, they were too afraid even to look at it. So he had to put a veil over his face. You can imagine what the, had the amazing light and glory that we should even approach unto God. But when we have immortal bodies, that is what makes the difference. When we are changed and we have uh, we are clothed upon uh, with our heavenly bodies, then we can. It's like, you know, like uh, um, uh, can you uh, you imagine? I think it was Jacob. He brought his sons Manasseh and Ephraim in his hands, and he brought them under. Uh, Joseph brought them under Jake, to, towards Jacob, his father. So like that, the Lord Jesus Christ, like a, you could say, like a chicken with its chicks under its wing, uh, he will present us to his father as his bride with such joy and happiness on that day. So we have to prepare ourselves uh, for that day and make ourselves ready. Salvation, as I say so many times salvation is a, a gift of God by grace and uh, when that seed of life comes into our hearts and brings new birth but uh, reward and readiness for the marriage is not by grace it's or to some extent it's grace but we have to uh, be prepared we have to prepare ourselves for it so the second point in verse 8, it says that the fine linen that the bride is wearing is the righteous deeds of the saints, not as in the King James, which said, right. You know, King James, this is just another example in Revelation where you, it's very difficult uh, to get the, uh, some of the sense in this book. So, because King James translates it, righteousness of the saints making you think this is original righteousness which you receive at new birth. But it's not like that. It's uh, The word in the original is clearly the righteous deeds of the saints. That what brings glory and beauty to the believer. Uh, the righteous deeds, the faithfulness uh, of uh, believers. So when we read in Revelation 3, about uh, the need, you know, one of the the cures, if you like, the medicine, uh, uh, is that the Lord in verse 18 will give us that we should make for ourselves white raiment. Uh, so, and these things are things we have to do ourselves, you know. It's not, you know, it, the Lord Jesus is speaking to believers here. He's not speaking to unbelievers. And these are things which we have to do. I cancel thee to buy of me gold. You know, God likes business. He likes the idea, why does God like business? Because it speaks of energy, of getting up and doing things. It's just the opposite to laziness. And that's why, you know, there's five foolish virgins you know, what was the advice of uh, the wise, five wise virgins? Go and buy uh, uh, oil for you. So buying business is very much in 
the, the thought of God because it speaks of energy and getting things done. And uh, if there's one thing, another thing that's very clear from this last day church is laziness. And uh, when you think, at, you know, what it took in 300 years for the early believers to get that 10% of the whole civilized world were born again, that was not done by lazy Christians, you know. It just started with 5,000 believers at Pentecost. But there were millions of believers uh, converted to Christ, born again, around the whole Mediterranean area, which was the civilized world in those days, even as far east as Babylon, and as far west as Spain and Europe. So, um, so... So these things are things which we have to do ourselves. And uh, it says that the shame of your nakedness did not appear. Above all, you know, how many times the Bible says that we should not appear naked, spiritually naked, uh, before God. God does not like this nakedness. He wants us to be clothed. And even, it wasn't very long before Adam and Eve, when they lost their beautiful robe of light, in the Garden of Eden because of their sin. God immediately came to the rescue and gave them skins. So he didn't want them to be naked. And anoint thine eyes with thyself and thou mercy. So, uh, spirit, how do we uh, anoint our eyes with thyself that we get spiritual insight into God's ways, understand God's ways and what he's doing uh, and of course, by reading the Word of God, that's how we—that's one of the ways we get insight by prayer, and by diligence seeking the Lord. And in verse 19, it says, "As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent." So whether we like it or not, God does take us through uh, the fires to prove. Because it works, you know, in that uh, one, of, one of those angels gatherings in Job. Uh, it, that's exactly how it, uh, how it works. God, God says to Satan, who was among, among them, Hast thou considered my servant Job, what an upright man he is? And Satan says, well, you, you uh, touch his body and he'll curse you to his face. So uh, God... Uh, God did it. God allowed Satan to do it. But God is always above, before Satan because God's purpose is he, he, he knew what he wanted to achieve in Job's life was holiness of heart. And so Satan was defeated by Job's learning the lessons that uh, God wanted him to learn. So uh, that's why we have to go through chastenings and problems but we have to learn to overcome in this life and uh, as I said before verse 20 uh, shows the Lord standing outside the door of this church in other words he wasn't among them he wanted to come in and he's knocking outside of the door and in verse 21 it says to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So, um, so there you have it very clearly, because in each message to each of the local churches here, it's the same thing the Lord Jesus says to every church. He that overcometh, and then he gives something that he will give, will partake of the tree of life or, or Will be given white robes or something like that. So this is the, you know, the great thing in life. You know, we have to learn to overcome uh, in this life and to be victorious in the trials and problems that we meet in our everyday life. And uh, so the prize is very great if we are willing to suffer for our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, he, hath a, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So that message also is in every to every church. To have 
spiritual ears uh, that we might understand spiritual things means spiritual eyesight and spiritual hearing that we understand and discern you know as believers we need to be discerning to be able to recognize truth when we hear it and you know without it you know that's why you know knowing the word of god gives us stability in our christian life so uh so these are uh all messages, as I said, to local churches. And we can learn a lot by these uh, messages to these local churches, uh, uh, which are written in the Book of Revelation. Okay.